Buying Microsoft is probably one of the greatest things that's happening for Microsoft, not necessarily for Nokia. <laughs> and we'll see about the third ecosystem uh, battle, but that's another topic. So we get our apps from different marketplaces, but where do we get them from physically? From which countries? Well, that's where it gets interesting. Um, Google Play covers 134 countries. That's a lot. That's quite a lot. That's pretty good in how many years? Four years of existence, five years, six, roughly. Well, Apple covers 155 countries. Well, I guess that's why the logo is bigger, right? It just expands. Windows Phone, 231 countries. So now let's think about the opportunity there, right? Google Play is a cheap OS. And when I say cheap, it means that it scales down to really cheap devices. Right? It's cheap for other reasons, in the sense that it's fragmented, it's really challenging and everything. But I'm not going to go over there. You've already discussed that. The App Store is a premium OS where a lot of people input their credit card even before getting the device, or sorry, for paying the device already. You go to the Apple Store, I want an iPhone, thank you very much, swipe your credit card. You haven't even opened the package, they already know who you are, your email address, and your credit, credit card details. But then, Windows Phone is everywhere, everywhere where these guys are not necessarily, which then opens new opportunities. So we're all users of someone else's app. We're all users of, of probably 10, 15, 20 apps. We probably have 50, 60, 100 of them on our phones. Now, thinking as a consumer, I'm looking at one app. Who is familiar with iCoyote? Who has ever heard about that? R can you raise your hands a bit higher because it's late? One, two, three, four, five. How many of you are Germans? No, in, <laughs> in the ones who know iCoyote. Got to follow a bit. So we've got one, two, all right, three. So iCoyote is from a company, a French company, all right? Um, they provide a service that um, alerts you of dangers on the road, meaning they save you money on the tax system imposed by the police with speed cameras. So it's, it's a pretty good service. Um, and in France, they have these devices, they also have these, um, uh, they, so they have the apps on, on Google Play and, and on iOS. And um, well, my, my, um, brother-in-law um, uses the device a lot. And one day I just came back to France from Finland. I was like, all right, well, I can, I can put that on my phone and I can have my phone on the dashboard. Let's go for it. Well, not really. So iCoyote is available in France. It's a French company. So if they wouldn't be available in France, it would be a shame, right? They're in their local market. It's also available in Germany. Or sorry, Spain. What well, Germany? Yes. And then Spain. Right. So they're neighboring countries. But you know what? It's not available for the rest of the world. How many Dutch people cross France every summer in their motorhomes and so forth? I mean, it might be a joke, it might be a cliche or something, but when I came to France, I'm French, I understand French language, I want to use a French app. Sorry, sir. The application is not available in their store. What? I can't download the app because I have a Finnish credit card in Google Play. And that's, you know, to change that now that I've moved back to France is almost impossible. I've been trying three or four times, Google Plus, settings and everything, to switch back to a French one, switch back to a French uh, market. It's a pain. When you put your credit card once, it's really challenging. On iOS, it's a bit easier, but it's still a step to make. So when you're traveling from one country to the next, 
some apps are not available. Who is publishing their app only in one country right now? Yeah, one, two over there. Can, can, we have, can we have some feedback from you guys? If we get the microphone, I'd like to hear what's your interest in having the app only in one country? So that was the very first stage. Uh, so we are planning the expansion. So I, I, I don't think it answers your question because it's, it's a temporary situation. Yeah, but exactly. So this we are is one, that's one of the points that I wanted to make is that it's not necessarily a bad thing to do that. To have the opportunity to select which market you want to launch the app in makes sense. In your case, for example, you want to go to a first test market. It might be a local market. You want to make sure that you know, it works, that you build some kind of interaction with the community and so forth. It makes sense. So language and platforms can be a tool in order to test things, in order to go to market, in order to build your audience. And that's where we're going to look at uh, another um, example. Angry Birds. Who does not have Angry Birds on their phone? Wow, that's a lot more than last year. All right, I guess it was the right move. Um, so I used to work there. The data that I'm going to be sharing are about um, a public article that's available on Wired. And um, so Rovio launched their game on the US store thinking that, hey, we've got a great game, great characters, great interactions. It's, it's really simple. My mother loves it. Everybody loves it at the office. It's great. Well, it didn't work. It didn't fly. It's maybe why they cut the wings, right? So it didn't work. Why? Because there was so much competition already at the time. What they did, and that was the smart move, is that they went to small countries, countries where the app stores were a lot smaller, where the offering was a lot smaller. Their app is not really difficult to localize. There's almost no text. It's all in the credits. So it was easy for them to go to Sweden, Finland, where they're from, Czech Republic, Denmark, and Greece. And that's where things got interesting. So Matt Wilson from Rovio says in that article that they managed to be number one in all these stores with as few as 30,000, 40,000 downloads. All right, granted, this is not the case anymore, most likely. But still, think about the local opportunity. And this is exactly what got them to be featured in the US and conquer the US, the UK, and now as many countries as there is of app stores. It was because they managed to be at the top of something that was really small that Apple was like, well, who are these guys that are at the top of these app stores? Well, they're the guys that we met a few months ago, but we didn't really believe in their app. Um, can we see them again? And then they got featured. So it might, I mean, you might not be able to replicate the um, Rovio story. Who would want to do that, right? But what you might be able to do is learn from it and, and see how you can, as this company over there, um, I haven't heard, I don't remember the name. I don't think I've heard the name. What was the name of your company or your app? One, two, three. Can we get the mic down there? Educational app. Educational application? Yeah. And is it available in Germany only or? Uh, you can download it. You can download it. It's not uh, limited in the App Store, but the promotional focus is on local market. All right, so you still have it open in, in the, the whole world? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that still makes sense. But basically, you, there is an opportunity in restricting the focus, so you can really build on the cultural differences, on the languages, and so forth. So, now there are plenty of languages, there are plenty of different places, and, and as the gentlemen say, we have to kind of focus our resources. We talked about marketing earlier, we talked about publicity, we talk advertisement and so forth. You can't be just spending money all over the place in every front. Um, so let's look at some numbers and 
The first one are from AppLift. They've got a great roll-up. Um, bless you. Um, they have a great roll-up um, in the uh, in the entrance um, that you can also find online. Um, that gives a lot of information about the opportunity. I was um, recently in in San Salvador and discussing with Movistar. Um, well, the smartphone business in Latin America is just growing. They only have in Salvador one million. 2 million devices, which is not a lot. But at the same time, every single operator is now fighting to be number one in that respect. They have really good 3G access. Um, it's growing. They're not yet on 4G. But they are getting to the point that people want apps. They want services. Now, interestingly enough, there are over 10 million Americans speaking Spanish, right? And two million of these Americans or people in the United States speaking Spanish are from San Salvador. So we're talking about social, we're talking about sharing, we're talking about telling people about cool stuff and everything. Now, could that be a route to market? Could you be number one in San Salvador, in El Salvador? And thanks to that, make your way to the US. I don't know. I'm not making apps, right? And that's something to try. But that, that's, these are all the opportunities. So if we look at it, there are major regions in terms of, um, let's say, benefits. Uh, North America is definitely the easiest one. A lot of companies go to um, Canada uh, to test their launch um, because it's a bit smaller market. It still speaks English and so forth. Um, then we have Western Europe. Um, the UK is a good place to start as well for the same reasons. Um, but some that are up and coming are Eastern Europe with Russia, um, where the local developers are still having a hard time themselves to organize their developers' activities. But the people are getting access to devices and services. So they are eager to grow their usage. They are eager to download apps and use apps. Cyrillic is a bit of a challenge in terms of implementing that in your app, so it might not necessarily be the best thing to look at, but still, it's a market that is a lot more, let's say, refraining from using English than others. Uh, Asia and Pacific, um, we definitely have the Chinese opportunity growing, and that's one place to look at, uh, but there are other smaller places. Um, Japan, for <coughs> example, we'll see later. Um, Middle East and Africa is still a place that's, that's having some, um, some challenges. They are, they are coming up and um, there are a lot of events organized over there, a um, lot of things to kind of raise the, uh, the awareness, um, but it's still fairly feature phone uh, driven. Um, and as I said earlier, Latin America could be a, a good opportunity. Now, the uh, top countries in each region um, that's also from the same stats. Uh, in EU, it's UK, France, and Germany. Um, in Middle East, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and South Africa. I guess South Africa is easy with English. Um, and then the upcoming uh, countries in Latin America, Brazil, Mexico, and Argentina. Um, now, from Appany, uh, who released their um, latest numbers for the App Store and, and Android, we can see that there is an evolution in terms of ranking in revenues. The um, downloads seems to be, I mean, they haven't um, been changing much, but in terms of revenue, we can see that China is climbing up, and that in that respect, um, United Kingdom and Australia are kind of going down. Um, not that much, though, just one, space, one spot. Um, if you look at Google Play, it's a different market, different devices, different usage as well. Um, there, South Korea and India are quite high up, and Brazil going up um, in terms of downloads. But then in terms of revenue, Japan is number one, South Korea number two, and United States behind. So th this is, these are numbers that are quite interested because I'm in rankings that are quite interesting because I wouldn't have believed that Japan could be bringing more revenue than the US. But the thing is, smaller population, faster spread of information, people that are willing to spend money, 
And whereas in the US you have a lot of people, but it's so fragmented that how can you reach everybody? Right? Um, now the question is that, is localizing enough? Should you just localize your app and then publish it? Is that going to really support growing revenues and, and business? Um, who has localized their app or services in the audience? Who has not localized their app and services in the audience? Okay, we still have some. Um, did you go, the, the ones who have localized their apps and services, have you gone beyond that or did you kind of stop in the uh, localizing the app? If you can raise your hand, if you localize your app, it's easier than to. Uh, so, gentlemen in the front, you've launched your app, you localize it, but did you go beyond just the app? Did you start speaking in different languages? Did you start sharing in different languages? So how? Yeah. And uh, the same, yeah, for the app, localized in nine different languages. But hell, I don't have the resources to 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 do support even. <coughs> Sorry, to do the support even in all the languages. I I just don't know. Only the app. So, but you would be interested in doing support because you see that's an important thing. Are you getting any requests in foreign languages? No. <laughs> so what is your app, if you mind me asking? Uh, it, it launched like three weeks ago and it's uh, basically a digital signage app. It's an app that does, um, uh, like you see the, the screens where you see advertisement in public space. And this as, as a standalone app, because we do this actually digital signage. And the app okay. is just for people to get to know what is digital signage. So you, you pretty much launched a service uh, essentially in Germany and or... Or can you can you use the service everywhere in the world? Like uh, we we want to we will open uh, next year in Russia an office uh, and in Israel and we are in Switzerland. Oh, you're in Switzerland. Sorry, it's German speaking side. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, but but ultimately the uh, the apps like can you see ads all around the world or can you only see ads in, in a specific location? Like uh, where we did localize, we have then also the ads, they are localized. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would make sense that the ad speaks also the local language. Yeah. That's what we did. But yeah, as you said, the support, it's like, you know, okay. we are very lucky that we don't get any requests in different languages. But yeah, support, newsletter sign up, all of these things is only English German because we don't have the resources for any other languages. Okay. There might be a solution to that. Um, so, we were talking about Shakespeare earlier. Thank you, by the way, for your answer. Uh, we were talking about Shakespeare earlier. Um, well, books have always been translated and adapted and, and so forth. And um, when you translate the book and adapt the book, you also translate and adapt the cover and the back cover that will then tell the story about the book, which is uh, exactly the same thing anywhere else. So localizing your app is the first step, then localizing all the descriptions in, in the uh, app stores and places where your app is available um, is the next. But then, and, and this is something, for example, that iCoyote has done. So they have localized all their content um, in the different stores that they're available, which is definitely a great thing. Now, the next step is engagement. We talked about customer support. They'll come in the next slide. Um, but how do you get people to discover your app in different places if you don't necessarily speak their language? Um, we've seen companies on Facebook, for example, having a Facebook page for each and every single country. Well, it's one way to do it, and you hire people that are going to be speaking about that, that are going to be engaging with people in the local language. Um, there are gaming company, for example, Supercell um, in Finland, that are really, really that they really want to be close to their customers, so they are going to be recruiting a person per language in order to be able to provide the customer service, the engagement, and so forth. But they can do that because they have a really high ARPU. They can, each and every of their customer is bringing them so much money that they can afford doing that. But as a small developer, you're starting, you can't necessarily do that, right? 
And in this case, it might be better to just stick to English or your local market and not necessarily grow in other places. But the interesting thing there is that Facebook allows posting and, and targeting um, from the Facebook page, for example. So if you have, uh, who has a Facebook page here in terms of services? Can you raise your hands a bit higher? So how many of you are using the uh, targeting on these Facebook pages? How many were not aware that you can do targeting on the Facebook pages? Okay, so it's a, it's a bit hidden um, within, the, um, within the settings. Uh, if I remember correctly, it's about uh, filtering content in the settings. When you activate filtering content, then you can do uh, the geo-targeting and you can target to even a lot of different um, options. But basically, now some companies are starting to target languages within the Facebook page, but are using one single Facebook page for everything. And this could be quite powerful for app developers and service providers because that's one way to start engaging with the community. Our app is not available yet in X language, but we'd like to hear what you think about it. And if you're interested, you can register on, on our newsletter so that we let you know as soon as the app is available. So these are the things that the, the different languages give you the opportunity for is that you can start building up your community in a language before you even have an app launched. Getting back to Rovio, they did a similar thing with, the, um, with their app in terms of iOS and Android. They refused, they refused to launch on Android for a long time, and the time that they launched on Android, they made millions and millions of downloads within a couple of hours. And that was all building the community, building the uh, incentive for people to keep looking at these things, to keep coming back and wanting more and screaming about it and so forth. So engaging on a different social media channel might be an opportunity to build up the audience, build up the community. Um, the last one, who knows the last picture? Who is familiar with that logo? We've got one, two. So the Great Firewall of China blocks the two first ones, and the third one is the local one. That's Sina Weibo. It's the Twitter of China. And Sharing your content on Sina Weibo is one way to build up engagement in China. Um, now we were talking about customer support. Uh, who is using Zendesk in the audience? Who is aware of Zendesk in the audience? Who is using customer service support via any platform? Let it be Zendesk or another one? Okay, so that's not that many. The, um, the opportunity with customer support uh, using a third-party platform is that it structures your customer support and you don't have to worry too much about it. Um, you still need to answer the, uh, the customers and so forth, but you can build up uh, history and track record and, and knowledge um, and sort and filter and, and so forth. So customer support is now becoming like the uh, uh, sales channels with Salesforce, SAP, and so forth, um, where there's a lot of follow-up leads and, and uh, so on. Um, now, you can do similar things with um, customer support uh, software as a service like Zendesk. Now, when you start going international, you can't grow your team as fast as the countries that you support. Um, hiring a person costs a lot of money, and you don't even know if you're going to need to support these people. So there is a phase in which you're unsure, does it really make sense to go international because then you can do supports and so forth. But ultimately, there are opportunities to, at the same time, figure out which country makes sense. In the startup environment, we've realized that your market is not where necessarily where you think it is. And there are successes that have happened um, where companies have launched in a certain market and realized that another market made more sense for them. So this is where, again, looking at it as um, let's give it a shot and let's see if it works. Let's see if we're going to get some feedback. Uh, could be an opportunity. And you can, you can always use Google Translate and these tools to kind of give yourself an idea of what are people saying, but it's not necessarily professional. So that's where we get to the sales pitch. 
and I hate doing that, so I'm going to be really fast. Um, so all these things are things that can be solved, um, but they shouldn't get in the way. You shouldn't have to go to Google Translate and copy-paste and then come back. You shouldn't have to ask somebody, send them a localization file and tell them that, hey, can you translate that? Then the project manager is going to come in the picture. Yes, we can. It's going to take 10 days, working days. Oh, God damn it. I'm in a startup. Working days every day. So how, how can you streamline these things? And that's where well, we're the Cisco of translation. Um, we're putting ourselves around the network. We've got over 20,000 translators um, accessible through our services. Um, and we're growing every day. Uh, we're partnering with translation companies, smaller, bigger ones, to make it seamless for people to communicate and engage in over 80 languages. Um, so we've integrated with Facebook, Twitter, uh, Weibo, Zendesk, Unity, and then we've got other services. Um, is there any real hardcore developers in the audience? Whoa. One? Two. Well, can we give them a bit of a clap? That's great, right? But the thing is, you guys, as developers, you don't want to have to care too much about the marketing people. You, the marketing people don't necessarily want to have to care too much about the developers. Of course, in a startup, you're kind of really connected. But when you send a localization file for the game, do you always think about adding the marketing message to it? Well, not necessarily. So in that respect, we've got an API for developers um, that enables the localization of their services directly from their back end, directly from the environment where they're building the apps so that they don't have to go through project management through all these things. And the really interesting thing with our platform is I was doing a test in Cupertino at a, at a fruit company that I can't mention. Um, showing them, showing to a new group, we're working with them, but showing to a new group um, how they can use our services. And it was 12 o'clock in the US, um, China was sleeping, and I like taking risks. I'm a skydiver and base jumper, so I take controlled risks. Um, and I've, I told my boss, and the guy's like, well, let's try Chinese. You know, Chinese people are sleeping right now, let's try Chinese. We put the translation out. My uh, boss, my CEO, was, um, well, you know, explaining to the audience that China is sleeping, so it might take some time and it might be challenging. Well, within 45 seconds, we had the translation. On in a minute. Yeah. So it'd be like 10, 15 minutes. So yeah. will you be ready with the cocktails? We're ready at 5 past 5 with the cocktails. OK, <laughs> 5 past 5, they'll be coming in. Um, Fine, he should could, be ready. Could we up uh, cut off James' yeah. microphone, yeah. please? Yeah. Okay. James. Thank you. James. Stop what? Your mic. <laughs> Stop talking. It's the end. It's the end of the day. Um, so we're having cocktails in 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we've got one more. Uh, have you finished now, Julian? <laughs> Sorry. <Okay>. Come on. <laughs> I'm, I'm two, minutes two minutes from finishing, okay. but your microphone was still on when you Sorry. were on the other side. Okay. So <laughs> that's all right. Um, where was I? 45 seconds. That's pretty much what it took to get a Chinese translation through our platform. Um, it's not real-time translation, but we call that near real-time, which means that as a developer, you can have that embedded in your uh, build environment. You go to sleep in the, mor in the evening or in the morning. Um, when you come back, you already have your translation done. On Facebook, you just put your post out, and straight away, somebody's going to start translating it, and it will be posted automatically. It's all seamless. You don't see it. You just connect all these things, and then they just happen. So these are the uh, kind of technologies that we support uh, for the developers. Now we're going to do a minute, two minutes, three minutes. Yeah, if anyone has any burning questions on internationalization, they should uh, feel free to ask them. And as you know, we have one more talk after that, and then cocktails, which you've heard. <laughs> so do we have any questions? Okay. Yes. Ladies first. 
If you can just tell your name and the Thanks. company you present. Uh, my name is Lena. I'm working for Expert here. Met me in the morning already. Uh, I have a qu so that sounds pretty great. Yeah, what you're doing, but Thanks. I have some more question when it comes more deep dive into product. I'm a product person. So uh, what do you do? Uh, so you offer translation. And uh, um, before I've been joining Expert here, I worked for another company where we also had like an app within uh, seven countries only. And you have this uh, challenge that maybe English is a very straight language. So one word with this on one button might have five characters mm -hmm. and sorry for the Dutch people here then maybe you have 10 and in Spain it's like 12 characters for the same word how do you uh, can assure that uh, the translation you're doing are still looking good and uh, in the product so now we're talking so that's a really great question and this is something that comes up regularly because people usually tend to associate localization and localization testing Right, so when you're translating an app or a service, um, unless there is a clear boundary, like 140 characters for Twitter, um, then no problem in terms of space on Facebook. Unless you don't have these clear boundaries in the platform itself, then you have to set them one way or another. And in apps and games, essentially, um, this is something that is fairly important. Well, thankfully, you can provide these information through the API and through the, um, if you send us a file, because we're still doing files, because people still use Excel files. Um, so if you send us a file, we can, we're going to still provide that information to the translator. And then they will do the job to abbreviate in the case um, that it's not long enough. But of course, you will still need to test your app and test the localization in terms of does it really fit in the screen or not. So we do, it, it's the same thing as if you would go to a, a traditional translation company like Lionbridge, except that with Lionbridge, it's going to take you one day to set up the project. With us, in one day, you already have some of the translations done. Thank you. Hi, uh, John Grotting from Caramelized. I'm curious about, uh, do you also deal with uh, cultural issues? Because not everything translates well or should be translated. Yes. Um, is, there any, is there any French people in the audience? Great. So uh, you might have heard about the Renault Coleos. Well, Coleos in, in some languages means balls. So that was a pretty bad marketing kind of trick from Renault to choose a name that is kind of uh, ballsy. Um, so this is cultural issues. And the um, interesting thing is we offer, so we offer three different levels of quality. Uh, we've got natives, professionals, and then professional and proofreader. And we, at first we were telling games companies, especially the bigger ones, that well, you, know, you should start using the professional quality. But then they made some tests with the native and they were like, well, in the end the native is a lot more casual, it's a lot nicer, and it's cheaper. But it's, it's more about the tone, it's more about these things. So. In certain respects, the translator quality will have an influence on how strict the frame is going to be. And because we can get feedback from the translator as well, then if something shouldn't be translated, if it needs to be changed to something else, they'll give the feedback. Thanks. Okay, so uh, really interesting talk. Thank you very much, Julian. And I'm sure you'll be sharing more insights um, in the drinks later. So big hand Thanks. for Julian. <laughs>